Awesome. Hey, welcome to Bridgeway. I know we've got a lot of guests in the room. If you haven't met, my name is Joel. I serve as the lead pastor here, and we are so honored that you'd spend part of this holiday weekend with us. I've heard some people say um, that you know Easter is the Super Bowl of Christianity, Super Bowl of being a Christian. Um, I want to up the ante a little bit as we get going. Like, I don't think it's the Super Bowl. I think it's the whole dang sport, y'all. Like, this is everything. Uh, I mean, I think, like, we are wasting our time. There's no Bible. There's no church. There's no hope. Our only logical response is despair and cynicism unless Jesus walked out of that grave on the third day. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Paul, in the first century, he's a church planner going around telling people about this risen Jesus, uh, which he actually saw face to face. He put it this way, and he just puts the gravitas into this so well. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. The ones that have gone before us believing in Christ, they are lost if this resurrection thing didn't happen. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Here's the reality check. If Jesus is still dead, if his body is still in the tomb, we are all wasting our time and people should be making fun of us. But if Jesus rose from the dead, you guys, all bets are off and it's a whole new world. I'm, this morning, I want to invite you to believe and trust in the resurrection. And I wanna invite you to believe and trust, maybe in the resurrection again, if you've walked away, I know we've got lots of different worldviews, lots of different ways to think about spirituality and faith and Jesus, the Bible in the room. Wherever you are, you are welcome here, but I wanna encourage you, I wanna nudge you to believe that this thing really happened in human history. And we believe it by faith because I'm not an eyewitness to it, you're not an eyewitness to it, but I don't believe it's blind faith. I just wanna share just a couple reasons as we kick this off why I believe we can trust that the resurrection of Jesus happened in human history, literally. First, women. Women. As we're gonna see today, women were the very first eyewitnesses to the empty tomb. They're the first eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. Let me ask you a question. In the early uh, first century, were women respected? No, some of you are like, women are still not respected. I get you on that. Um, <laughs> but in the first century, women could not learn. They could not work in the marketplace. Their testimony wasn't even valid in a Roman court. So if you're making up a religion and you're making the Bible out to be propaganda to try to convince something, somebody that something happened, you would never say that women were the eyewitnesses, the first ones to the empty tomb. You just simply wouldn't do it. But women were the first ones to see the empty tomb and the resurrected Jesus. You guys, I want you to consider that this thing actually happened. Next, I want you to consider the apostles, the first followers, disciples of Jesus in the first century. I don't know about you, but my parents taught me at a young age, always follow the money. See who's benefiting on the back end of any kind of lie. Someone's always working it out to where they benefit, right? I wanna ask you, the disciples, the first followers of Jesus, how did their lives end up? They all died fameless, penniless. Many of them died rotting in prison and exile. And also many of them were killed by the Roman Empire. And all they had to do was bend their knee to Caesar and say, yeah, this whole Jesus is Lord thing, it was a nice sentiment, but it's not real. Caesar is Lord. But none of them did that. They refused to bend their knee to the empire to say that it was fake. They went to their grave. Often they went to an excruciating death because they said that we saw the resurrected Jesus and all bets are off. They didn't get a little nice little nest egg for them in Thessalonica where they could kick it later. <laughs> but they ended their lives fameless, penniless, and brutally killed because they believed in the resurrection. This thing had to happen. Here's one I've always got to go to. Uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Did you guys know this? Half brothers and sisters. And many of them were around his age. One of them goes by the name of James. And James ended up being one of the early leaders of the first church in Jerusalem. And he wrote a book of the New Testament, uh, creatively titled James. And at the very beginning, the very first verses of James, he says this. Again, this is Jesus' brother. He says, all to Jesus my Lord. Let me ask you a question this Easter Sunday. What would it take for you to call your sibling, your brother or sister, your Lord? 
it'd take a resurrection. That's the only thing that makes sense. This thing had to happen. One more reason why I believe in the resurrection. That this weekend, this very hour, you guys, all corners of the globe, north, south, east, and west, all different colors and flavors of people, all different worldviews and political systems and languages, people are gathered to hear the story, to remember the death and the resurrection of this Jesus. 2,000 odd years later, we're still compelled by this day laborer from Galilee where nothing ever good comes from Galilee. And his story, what is this? Something happened. I want to encourage you, to nudge you, to shake you a little bit, to believe that this resurrection of Jesus literally happened. And it changed everything. And you guys, it is still changing everything everything. Let's go to the text. In the, in the New Testament, we have four different biographies, ancient biographies of Jesus' life. You know, in the ancient world, most of the time, uh, wealthy people or influential people might have had one biography. We have four of them in our New Testament written by eyewitnesses to these accounts. And we get these resurrection accounts near the end, and they're fascinating. It's like this cataclysmic event that nobody expected came bursting into reality. And we just see people in their real lives dealing with this new world that it opened up. The Gospel of Luke records it like this. Friday, Jesus died. Saturday's the day of silence. Very early on Sunday morning, the first Easter, the women went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. I think this is such a very important detail. Their women are coming to take spices to the tomb, not because they were expecting a resurrection, but because this is what you did when you had a loved one pass away. You wanted to send spices, bring spices to honor them, to make sure there wasn't a stench coming out of that tomb. So where people would come and mourn them, it would be a pleasant smell. These women did not expect a resurrection, you guys. There's realism in this. They were expecting to have a body there. Let me put it this way, that on the first Easter, nobody expected no body in that tomb. We like to think we're smarter than ancient people. Nobody thought that a resurrection was happening. These women are here to pay homage and respect to their dead leader and rabbi. Then we're told this. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, they still didn't know what was going on. Maybe somebody took the body. What is going on? Two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. They come across two messengers that had to be something like an angel, right? And we would like to think that, oh, an angel met me, and this is like this beautiful moment, touched by an angel. Like, this is this amazing thing, right? But I love the realism that Luke gets us, that these women were terrified. This was nothing they would have expected. This is something that would have struck them with fear, because I don't know about you, but in my day-to-day life and following Jesus, I never came face-to-face with an angel. If that's you, that's cool. I'd love to talk to you about it later. That's weird and awesome. We're not there. But anyway. We see the terror in these women's eyes as these men face them. And then the angels, these men, they ask the women a question, a powerful question, a question that changes everything. The men ask, why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here. He has risen. Plot twist. You didn't see that coming. But you're here in a tomb. You're here in a cemetery. And he's not here anymore. He is risen. But that question that the angels ask the women on that very first Easter, I think it's a question that begs us to wrestle with as well. Why do you look for the living among the dead? And although there's been millennia past, there's been so much time past and so much has changed, I believe this, that we still look for life in dead places today, don't we? I know that I do. We still look for life in dead places today. I know this about you, even though I don't know you very well, is that you want to experience life to the fullest. You want to like take the orange that is life and squeeze every ounce of juice that you possibly can, see amazing things, have fulfilling relationships, make a difference with your life, leave your mark. We want to get life in all that it is in us and through us. But I believe that our culture, you guys, it sells us a bill of goods about where we find it. And so often we run down trails that we think we're going to find life, and it's just another dead place. It's just another lie. I know, at least for me, it is. 
There's a couple of these I want to talk about just for a few minutes here. The first is what we like to call the performance lie. And it says this. This is what uh, the lie that our culture tells us, the dead place tells us, that we are what we produce and achieve, that this is our identity, what we are. This is a dead place that we look for life. You guys, this is baked into our culture, isn't it? You know, baby's born. People want to know first, how long is the baby or how tall is the baby? How much does the baby weigh? We want to know soon after, are they meeting their milestones? And as parents, we freak out if they're not meeting their milestones when they're supposed to. They go to school. We want to make sure that they have friends and that they're getting good grades and they're behaving. And into high school where we want to make sure their GPA is good enough so they can go to the college that they want to go to or go to their next step, whatever that might look like. And then it goes into the career world where we want to get the best job right out of college at the influential company where we can make a difference where we get the good benefits package, where we get the corner office, where we have the great title that we can brag about to our friends. This is just baked into our culture, that we are what we produce, what we achieve, the ladders that we climb, the stairs that we climb. But there's a problem with this, right? This is actually a dead thing, a dead way to see ourselves. Because there's always, (laughs) there's always a next rung on the ladder to climb. There's always somebody ahead of us, isn't there? I mean, it's exhausting, isn't it? Oh, it's exhausting. Us trying to reach and scratch and claw and climb. It is exhausting. Makes us feel like we're human doings instead of human beings. But here's the truth of Easter. Easter and the resurrection of Jesus announces a deep truth. that It announces that God loves you just as you are and not as you should be. Resurrection announces that your debt has been paid and that God is crazy about you, that he went all the way through death to the other side for you. Hear me in this. In a life where we try to like play out our highlights over and over again and display our highlights, God loves you the same in your lowest moments as he does in your highest moments. Moments. He's not waiting for you to reach the new amount of clients in your business. He's not waiting for you to reach a certain zero in your bank account added to your total. He's not waiting for you to get your stuff together to where you become something and then he loves you. No, the resurrection announces right here and right now. The most important thing about you is that you are God's beloved. It's your first name. It's your last name. It's the most important thing about you. So don't find your identity And the performance lie because it's a bill of goods. It's not real. And the resurrection announces a different reality. That he loves you just as you are and not as you should be. Next dead place that we look for life is what we call in possessions, the possession lie that says that we are what we have, what we accumulate, what we can call mine or ours. And I realize that status symbols are not a new thing. Did you guys know this, that in the 1800s in Europe, um, if you were in Europe in the 1800s, you know what a status symbol was? Like, it was a pineapple. Can't make this up. If you had a pineapple in the 1800s in feudal Europe, uh, you were somebody special. You were a big deal because it meant that you were wealthy enough to have produce shipped to you from across the ocean. In the 1980s, when John Cusack was doing his thing in the movie Say Anything, you know what a status symbol was? Boombox over the head. I just want to listen to that song over and over again. But to carry around your tunes with you in your own personalized library, that was a big deal. Today it might look like a certain pair of sneakers. It might look like a vehicle that you plug in. It could look a lot of different ways. But we still reach for these things thinking this is what's going to make me feel valued. My identity is this. It's like going to scratch this itch that nothing else can do if I just own this thing, if I have enough for myself. But there's a problem with this lie, right? It is a lie. Because we get the thing. And there's always a new model coming down the pike, right? We get the thing, the possession we think that's going to make us happy, and the shine just wears off after a while. It might be an adrenaline rush for a little bit, but the shine wears off pretty quick. The resurrection, you guys, announces a deeper reality for us to grasp and put our lives around. And it's this, the resurrection announces that you already possess enough in Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you put your trust in him, you already are enough and you already have enough in Christ that you don't need to scratch and claw and reach for anything else to bring you value or identity. You're already enough. You already possess enough. 
Paul wrote to a group of Jesus followers in the city of Rome, and he said this scandalous idea that I can't wrap my head and heart around completely. He says this, that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, the power and the presence that caused the resurrection to happen, it lives in you. The third person of the Trinity, the triune God, the power and the presence of God lives within you. Jesus, in the Gospels, he shared with his disciples, his his students, he said that there's going to be a helper come. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And it's even better that he's here with you and in you than me walking around with you. That's a mystery, isn't it? But what would it look like if we believed that because of the resurrection, we already are enough, we already have enough, that we don't need to accumulate and scratch and claw for the next thing for us to own because that's a bill of goods. It's a lie. And the resurrection tells us the truth. One more dead place that we look for life is in popularity, what we call the popularity lie. It's this idea that we are what people think about us. Our highlights, the things that people say about us, we walk into a room and people whispering about us, we want them to think the good things. We're driven by this reality, right? I mean, I find it in myself in the realm of social media. A couple weeks ago, uh, my wife and I were on vacation. We're getting ready for dinner. We just turn on the TV and on the television, this is, this is amazing, was the 2002 cinematic masterpiece. It won the Oscar for the greatest movie of all time ever, um, the Adam Sandler comedy, Mr. Deeds. If you know, you know. But I start watching this movie, and I'm like quoting every line. Like, I know it by heart. And my wife looks at me and goes, you are such a loser. I said, you don't get it. You're underestimating the sneakiness. You don't get it. Right? So, I, so I start thinking, I'm going to post about this. Oh, this is going to be funny. Like, this is going to be so funny. I'm like, I got this post. Oh, it's going to go viral. Everybody's going to think this is hilarious. So I craft this post, and I put it on Facebook and Instagram. It's this right here. I said, my toxic trait is knowing the movie Mr. Deeds by heart with a little clip from the movie. Put my phone down. A couple minutes, go brush my teeth, come back, and I'm like, how many likes? How many shares? Oh, man. One like, no shares. <laughs> Maybe people are just not. They're just not on the internet right now. That's what I'm telling myself. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes, put my phone down, come back to it. Four likes, no shares. People are idiots. They don't get how funny this is, right? And I was like so taken aback by it, and it just never took off. And it's just another reminder, and this is just me being real with you, that I like people to think I'm funny. I like people to think I'm clever. I want to be liked. I want to be popular. And I imagine that you do too, And we drive our lives to people please and to do so much to get people to say nice things about us for them, to see this presentation that we put in front of them. But man, it's got problems, right? It doesn't work. It doesn't last. It's exhausting. We end up finding ourselves in this weird twist of imposter syndrome where we don't know exactly who we are. And we keep thinking that if the right person thinks this about me, then I'm going to finally be somebody with our chest puffed out. But the resurrection, you guys, it announces a deeper truth, a deeper reality for you to wrap your identity around. The resurrection announces God's blessing over your messy humanity. Do not miss this, you guys. The resurrection announces God's blessing, his seal of approval over your messy human body and your messy human life. Notice, when Jesus came out of the tomb and when people had interactions with him, he wasn't a ghost, he wasn't a spirit. He had skin and he had bones and you could still see the scars in his hands and in his feet. This was a way of God hearkening us back to the very beginning of the scriptures and the creation poem where God made the world and everything in it and God made humankind. What did he say? He says, This is very good. The resurrection is God doubling down on saying that you are very good. (laughs) He's a seal of approval over who you are in your inmost being. And yes, we're hot mess express. Yes, we have brokenness. Yes, we are rebellious against God. Yes, we hurt others. We hurt ourselves. And he sees that all. And he still says, oh, I love you. It's a blessing over your life, your body. It's not just an empty shell, but it is good, and God is in the business of restoring all of it. Now, what could happen if we trusted this blessing from our creator, God, saying that we are good and that we are enough 
and he affirms us. Man, what would happen if we trusted that voice instead of looking for love and approval and popularity, as the old country song says, looking for love in all the wrong places? Oh, it would change everything. I want to wrap my life around this blessing <laughs> instead of chasing it in other ways. Let me ask you this, though. Just like the women on that first Easter morning, are you looking for life among dead places and dead things? Are you there? Have you picked up the lie, the bill of goods that our culture gives us that we are what we produce, achieve, we are what we own, we are what other people think about us? And if so, stay with me. Stay with me. Because the resurrection speaks to exactly where you are. John gives us this account next of what happens with Mary at the tomb on that Easter Sunday. He tells us this, that she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him, which is just mind-boggling. It again shows us the realism inside of this story. It shows us how grief can affect you through the tear stains and the cloudiness of your vision. You just can't see clearly what's going on, and you've lost your equilibrium when you're grieving, right? She doesn't even recognize it's Jesus. And he says to her, dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. She was so off in this moment. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. She's still confused thinking that someone had stolen the body of Jesus. But in the next few seconds, everything changed for Mary. She went from black and white to vibrant living color. This is what happens next. Jesus said, Mary. Her name was on her rabbi's lips, and she could recognize her name on his lips. She turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which is Hebrew for teacher. But it's not just Hebrew for teacher in the way that rabbi is. Rabbani is upping the ante. It's not just saying my master or my Lord. It's saying my greatest master, my greatest Lord. And in that moment, everything changed for Mary. Can you imagine the miracle that she experienced in this moment? The, the trip from despair into hope. We're told this next. Jesus said, don't cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your fat Father, to my God and your God. Jesus, the risen Jesus, gives Mary a mission to go tell the boys about what just went down. Can I get on my soapbox for just a second? Do you see what's happening here? The risen Jesus is directly commanding a woman to go preach the resurrection on the first Easter Sunday. Woo. How dare we ever say that a woman can't preach when she's got a message to share? Jesus told her, go tell the boys who are cowering in the upper room that something new is going down. Let's not stand in the way of women when they got a message to share. You guys good with that? Okay, let's go back to the text. How do you say that? Here, Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. She told them, I have seen the Lord. This wasn't just her saying that I, I've seen my rabbi. This is be below the surface, beneath the surface, to where she's seen the reality of the risen Jesus. She's seen a reality of a world that's not just shaped by the despair and the agony and the violence of Good Friday, but she's got her eyes opened up, going from black and white to living vibrant color to a world being shaped by the empty tomb. She's gone from despair into hope. She's seen the Lord, the reality of Easter, and she's walking into it. My friends, you and I have been invited to say that we have seen the risen Jesus and we are living and walking into a new reality because there's a new world being born right in the midst of the old one. And it's not shaped by agony of a cross, but it's shaped by the empty tomb. That's picking up what I'm putting down. You and I, we have been invited to see everything different because of the resurrection. N.T. Wright, an Anglican uh, priest and a New Testament scholar, he says this about what hope uh, looks like because of the resurrection. He says, hope is what you get when you suddenly realize that a different world is possible, a world in which the rich, the powerful, and the unscrupulous, or the deceitful, do not, after all, have the last word. The same worldview shift that is demanded by the resurrection of Jesus is the shift that will enable us to transform the world. My friends, we've got to see the world different. 
Because we might be living in the midst of a Good Friday world, but we are called to be Easter people who have our vision and our lives and our work and our creativity and our love and our service all be shaped by the resurrection. Come on, this is what this looks like, you guys. This is what it looks like for us to be people shaped by the resurrection. It looks like this, for us to understand that generosity wins out over greed and scarcity. It means that we can walk in a way of hospitality and generosity and open hands instead of clasped fists for our stuff because Jesus got out of the tomb and there's a new world happening around us. Uh, One of my roles, um, I have the privilege of serving on the board of Kokomo Urban Outreach, which is this incredible nonprofit that's been in our community for the last 20 some years. And in one of these programs, we serve um, underserved, under-resourced youth, and we give them opportunities to work and learn what it means to be hardworking and reliable and to be a person of your work and to have dignity by earning something for themselves. They earn points that turn into dollars and then Visa gift cards. It's a way that they can actually earn for themselves and have dignity instead of somebody just giving them something. I heard the story last year of a 13-year-old boy who had saved up his points for so long, he had $100. So they gave him a $100 Visa gift card. And what does he do next? You might think he goes to buy something for himself, buy a new pair of shoes, buy something fancy, a video game, something like that. But no, he walks downtown, about a 15-minute walk, and he goes in front of the uh, Kokomo Library, and he sees there are two homeless people sitting in front of the library, a man and a woman, and the woman has got duct tape on her feet instead of shoes. The young man. I uh, asked them, hey, are you guys hungry? Yeah, we're, we're really hungry. But he doesn't just go and get a burger. He doesn't go to a fast food joint and spend just like $3, do the dollar menu thing. Oh, no. He's looking at the world through the lens of the empty tomb. He walks down to Marble Steakhouse and gets two filet mignon dinners to go <laughs> and brings them this food. Then when he hands them the food, he takes off his shoes and gives them to the woman with duct tape on her feet. What? This is crazy. But there's something inside of you that just woke up. This is what it means to look at the world through the lens of the empty tomb. That generosity wins out over greed and scarcity. Greed and scarcity are not right and they will not last because they belong to death and death does not belong in this world anymore, y'all. You know what else it means? To look at the world through the empty tomb lens, it means this, that forgiveness wins out over violence and vengeance. It might look in the headlines like violence and vengeance wins the day. Oh, but that's just a shadow of reality. Forgiveness wins out in the end. You might recall in December of 2015 in Charleston, South Carolina, an Emmanuel AME church, uh, a 21-year-old white supremacist walks into a Bible study and he guns down nine women in this Bible study, saying he wants to start a race war. Just tragedy on top of tragedy. One of the women that were killed in this Bible study was the the pastor's wife. The pastor's a guy by the name of Anthony Thompson. Anthony Thompson, two days later, goes to the bond hearing for Dylan Roof, who had just murdered his wife and eight other of his congregants. And he gets there. And he says these words that make no sense. But he says, son, I want to let you know that I forgive you. My family forgives you. And I want to ask you to take this opportunity to repent, to turn around from the way that you're seeing the world in your life and trust Jesus. What? What? He said in his book, Called to Forgive, my body began to shake and I was light as a feather. It was as if I could float in that room. I've got that same peace today This forgiveness allowed me to move forward. He later said, and he called this act of forgiveness a form of resistance and rebellion against the way that the world used to be or the way that we think the world is. He says, you know what? This is an act of rebellion and resistance against a Good Friday-shaped world because I'm living in an empty tomb world. I'm living in an Easter world. What? This is so hard for us to grasp, but I know this about you, that something inside you just woke up. Because this is what's really true. This is what wins. Lastly, I want you to hear this. That hope wins out over despair and cynicism. Oh, it's easy to be cynical. It's so easy for me to be cynical. Can I confess that to you? It's easy for me to be filled with despair. When you not only hear about death and all of its ugly minions, but when you look death in the eyes, 
just this last week, I've had dear friends lose family members way too young, unexpected. And it's easy to just throw in the towel and say, yeah, this is what it is. Do you know what Easter whispers to us? Do you know what Easter begs us to consider and lean into? Is that hope wins out over despair and cynicism. As Samwise Ganji said in Lord of the Rings, where all great wisdom comes from, everything sad is ultimately becoming untrue. That the worst things that happen to us are never the last things. Because Jesus walked out of the grave. Because Jesus walked out of the grave, we know that there is hope. And we can live in that hope, you guys. So let me ask you a question. A question to turn from Mary's message around for us. Put it this way. Have you seen the Lord? And no, we haven't seen physically the resurrected Jesus. But have you seen the reality of Easter? Are you walking into the reality of an empty tomb shaped life? Or do you believe the lie that our world tells us that this place, this earth, it's a lost cause? It's a cold, dead, dark place. Guys, don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype. Lean your life up against the hope of the resurrection. That there's a new world being born right in the midst of the old one, and it's not shaped by the agony of a cross, but it's shaped and formed and forged in the real hope of resurrection. And we can walk in it. We can partner with God, lock arms with God, and just spread it with the way that we live and work and care for those around us.